Good evening, or just hello, depending on where you are. My name is James Harding, I'm the editor and co-founder of Tortoise, and I'm delighted tonight to welcome you to a thinking on global leadership, or perhaps more precisely, on the absence of global leadership in the face of a global pandemic. Um, we are lucky, I'm very grateful tonight to be joined by Madeleine Albright, uh, Secretary of State for President Clinton, and of course, uh, time to a US ambassador to the United Nations. Um, so uh, a person particularly well placed to talk about US leadership in the world and the potential of global leadership. Uh, we're joined too by uh, Jayathma uh, Wickramanayake, who is uh, based in New York, is the UN Secretary General's uh, Special Envoy for Youth. Um, and, and likewise, Jayathma, thank you for being here this evening. And uh, a particular thank you to Gail Smith, the Chief Executive of the One Campaign. Um, uh, we've been delighted to work with the One Campaign. Uh, they're campaigners, we're journalists, but we both seem to be animated by the same sets of things. And what the One Campaign has been driving us to do through this pandemic is not succumb to the delusion that it is a great leveller, it's a great magnifier of problems in the world. And in its campaigning, particularly in its focus on global leadership to protect the most vulnerable in the world, it's trying to coordinate the concerns that people have across the planet to do something about this. And in the course of the next hour, we're looking forward to hearing from Gail, from Madeline, from Jayathma about exactly what can be done and practically what we can do to assist those people who are trying to deliver global leadership. And in that spirit, I should just say to you one thing about a thinking, which is intended to be like an editorial meeting, like a news meeting. Everyone should chip in. So I know not all of us here have served as secretaries of state, uh, or even for that matter, UN special envoys or running global campaign organizations, but all of us have a personal experience of what we're seeing right now and, and a point of view and a perspective. And we're gonna to come to a better informed point of view and potentially a more powerful one, the more people weigh in. So from the very start, please do exactly that. Uh, you'll see that my uh, colleague Liz Mosley is, I was gonna say managing the chat. I'm not sure you can even do that, but you know, certainly be alongside it. Do weigh in and uh, tell us there's Liz, hello. And do, uh, do, do weigh in and I will try and bring you either your point or you in person into the conversation. If you're a dab hand at Zoom calls, you'll also know that you can hit the participants tab and the participants tab then has a little gray box that allows you to, to, to raise your digital hand. And if you do that again, I'll try and bring you in uh, and make sure you're part of the conversation. It's really important to us that we hear as much from you as we do from the esteemed gang uh, that have drawn us here together this evening. So please do um, uh, weigh in as much as, uh, as possible. But I am gonna start with you, if I might, Secretary Albright. Um, it, it's tempting to start in the US, but actually I'd like to think about global leadership from the start. You know, this weekend, the G7 leaders were due to meet at Camp David, in fact. They're not meeting. It's a sort of vivid reminder of the absence of global leadership. But if you still were Secretary of State, what would you put on the to-do list of the G7 leaders? Well, first of all, let me say how delighted I am to be able to be a part of this discussion, and there are many things to talk about. Um, I think if I were Secretary of State, I would try to undo all the horrible things that have happened recently in order to undermine the position of the United States in terms of dealing with uh, issues that know no borders. But let me say the following thing. I think that, um, and just for a little bit of historical context, I think this is the most serious and dangerous period since World War II. Um, and really looking at uh, what happened then, by the way, I'm old enough to have been in London during the Blitz um, during World War II. Uh, and then looking at how the world tried to figure out what the structure was going to be in order to deal with the post-World War II problems. Um, and I do think that just very quickly, um, obviously, uh, that uh, cliche that if it didn't exist, we'd invent the UN now. Mm -hmm. But bottom line is people and organizations in their 70s need a little refurbishing. And the UN does. But in the meantime, there have been 
uh, ways that the UN has been used and their chapter eight deals with regional organizations and it is um, also totally acceptable to the international system to have groups that are kind of subgroups of major powers or a variety of collection of countries in order to deal with very specific problems, which is where the G7 comes in. Um, and and Secretary, so, sorry, Secretary, so, um, Secretary, just explain to me, when you say chapter eight groups, what do you, what do you mean by that? How would those work? You know, um, you know and the regional organizations that um, the UN can cooperate with and does often like to cooperate with, um, I, just to get into something that I was involved in when I was in office was trying to figure out how NATO was able to deal with some of the problems in the Balkans. Um, mm -hmm. or there is a way that, um, in fact, uh, it ha was a, already envisioned that there would be various groupings that would assist the United Nations as a whole, which obviously didn't have this many members. By the way, I won the United Nations contest um, when I was a sophomore in high school for what is known as the Rocky Mountain Empire, Colorado, Wyoming, uh, Nevada, et cetera, mainly because I could name the 51 countries that were members of the UN at that time. So, uh, but I do think that the G7 was an organization that was created in many respects, first of all, to deal with economic issues yes. uh, and trying to see how uh, the major powers could work together. It has gone through various iterations. At a certain stage, there was an attempt to add the Russians to it, the G8. Um, and when the Russians then invaded Crimea, um, they were taken off the list. But the bottom line is the G7 has not really been that active recently. And the fact that it was going to be in the United States um, under a president that is not particularly interested in organizations um, and then it came at a very peculiar time. So I do think that I personally believe in the existence of a variety of groups that are created in order to help solve the problems. And especially uh, when in fact no problem, and especially now when the virus knows no borders and there is really a need to try to get more countries involved in what is going on. But the whole kind of scenario around the G7 and initially having it be a Camp David and then deciding that they wouldn't and also because of the virus, it couldn't take place and Angela Merkel saying she wasn't coming. So there yes. are all kinds of things that one can add to this uh, story. But, but so sure, bro, I'm, I'm going to, firstly, I have to say to you, that if you could be speaking and reading the volume of chat, the torrent of text messages, there's a lot of admiration and for my part, no small bit of jealousy about your brooch. So <laughs> that's, definitely, that, that's definitely one prize. But I want to bring in, if I can, Sally Young, because I thought that we would be drawn almost immediately to talking about Donald Trump. But actually, Sally Young's got a, a different point about the leadership in the world that is working. Sally, over to you. Thank you very much. I'm from the northeast of England. Um, it, it's to all the panel, but particularly to Secretary Albright, given her comments on gender and women in the past. And I wonder if I can say anything about where leadership has been good, because I think there have been places. And I'll mention um, Arden, Merkel, Ingwen, and some of the Scandi prime ministers. I could be being um, very specific here, but I wonder if there's something there about female leadership and trust relationships and communication. Secretary O'Brien? Yes, well actually I've been very interested uh, that the countries where they have been able to control the virus are run by women. And I do think that there is something. First of all, I do think um, as women have gotten into positions of authority, um, that we have gotten there, not by telling everybody how smart we are and being egotistical and saying, I'm in charge and you're not, but basically by cooperative and having really worked in terms of being dependable and being able to work together. I think that's one of it. The other is I do think women are uh, very good at multitasking. We have to be given all the things that we're often asked to do simultaneously, which I believe gives us peripheral vision. Um, I do think what I, I don't often say that men and women think differently, but I do think that women do have this peripheral vision. I think men may be more interested in looking at one subject and examining it more deeply than some women would want to, but 
those are gross generalizations. I also do think that women, uh, because uh, we, op we have often have children who may disagree with each other, and what you try to do is get them to agree instead of having one group of children hate the other group of children. And so our natural instinct is to try to get people to work together. I also do think that women are decisive and are capable of taking other people's views and, uh, into consideration as decisions are made. Um, and I do think that uh, there is something about wanting to listen and hear from others. So I think it's a, it's a very interesting question about why it does work uh, in, uh, with women leaders. And I do think that the world would be better off if there were more women leaders. We were, so sure, right, we were talking last week in our newsroom about what a matrix would look like that had, if you like, decisive and indecisive along one axis and inclusive and divisive along the other. And you can see that there are a group of people who might sit at the top in the divisive and indecisive box and a group of people at the other side that would sit in the inclusive and decisive box. And it'd be interesting to map exactly who they are. And I suppose that leads us, you know, before I go to Jaffa, I just wanted to get a sense from you on whether or not the US is failing to lead because it's a choice that the century of US leadership in the world has come to an end because the American people, to an extent, in the choice of this president, don't want to engage as much as they once did in the world. Whether or not you think it's a structural change in the world, whether the rise of China, the shape of the world has changed, or whether or not you think it's, if you like, one of those spasms of history, but the US leadership will and has the potential through existing structures to return. Um, you may regret asking me any questions since I'm a professor and it takes me 50 minutes to say something. I'll but, take the risk. And I teach about this a lot. I do think the following thing. I think people don't understand the fact that the United States is not and never has been a country that wants to dominate the international scene. Uh, one can go through history and look at how we have at various times be brought in to do something, but it's not a natural inclination. Um, I do think that what had happened is that there were those that were not enamored of how much the United States was involved um, and began to think about how did domestic and foreign policy go together. And I can tell you that when I went to the UN in 1993, it really was a time where the American public had wanted to concentrate more on what was going on at home. As President Clinton said, it's the economy, stupid. Uh, mm -hmm. What I think is also interesting, President Clinton was the first one that said America was the indispensable nation. It's just that I said it so often it became identified with me. But there is nothing about the word indispensable that says alone. Right. Uh, means a partner, to be engaged and a partner. Now, Americans don't like the word multilateralism. It has too many syllables and it ends in an ism. But it is basically about partnership and burden sharing and a number of different ways to operate together. And as the world has gotten more complicated, there are more and more partners for different parts of things as we, various groups being created and some ad hoc, some permanent. But I think that what happened is that there was kind of a reaction about the United States being overextended, some having to do with the war in Iraq, um, some with Afghanistan, and there really was kind of a sense that there needed to be some kind of pullback, but not to the extent that has happened where uh, Trump believes that the U.S. is a victim, um, that uh, we don't need to be a part of anything, and what has happened is the U.S. has been AWOL um, across the board, um, and therefore um, the system hates a vacuum, and the Chinese have stepped in to um, play their role, as have others. But one can talk about this an awful lot. I think we're in a very different era. And mm -hmm. I also do think that now, as a result of the virus, it is different than it even was last year. And I think that one needs to think about how the system can adapt to dealing with, as I said earlier, a virus that knows no borders, that is affecting life in all kinds of countries, and is. Um, has something to do with the rise of 
um, those leaders that can't solve it because they are pitting one group of people against another. Uh, and Secretary Albright, how much of US power rests on moral authority? And what do you think Donald Trump has done to, the, to America's moral authority? Well, I think um, it's interesting. I've just been reading a new book by Joe Nye on moral authority and moral decision making. Um, I do think that um, I, I believe that moral authority is important until it becomes moralistic, where one, we go around telling everybody how to behave rather than thinking on what basis we make our decisions. Um, but I do think that uh, there is a very important part to moral. There's always this argument, you know, between whether American foreign policy is idealistic or realistic. And I've always thought it was a false dichotomy, maybe uh, mainly because I didn't know whether I was an idealistic realist or a realistic idealist. Um, and you clearly need both. And the way I describe it is that foreign policy is a little bit like a hot air balloon. You need the idealism to get the balloon up, and then you need the realism to get it going in the right direction. Um, and so it has to be a combination, and obviously moral authority does play a role in that. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to come back to you, particularly you mentioned China, and I'd like to come back to that. And I would also like to talk a little bit about constructively what global leadership can do. But you know, you started off by talking about the UN and the capacity of the UN, even if it needs some, uh, I think you've used the phrase, refurbishment. And we're lucky to have Jayathma here. Um, Jayathma, um, I don't know how I'd feel if I worked for the UN. I sort of have this, I had this childhood adoration and admiration for the UN. And now I look at it and I'm so frustrated. And I don't know whether it's fair to blame the UN, whether you're frustrated by it, but, but where is the global leadership going to come from to deal with what is clearly a global set of problems? Thank you so much, James. Um, I mean, I certainly feel the same way sometimes. And, you know, I was leading a youth organization back at home in my country, Sri Lanka, working on political participation, post-conflict reconciliation among young people in my country. And I gave all that away to come and work for the UN. And since the moment that I came to the UN and started working about it, what you expressed is exactly what I've been feeling. And I went to the secretary general, who is my boss, and I asked him, you know, why can't we move some of these things along? And um, he told me two things. The first thing he told me is that the UN is only as good as the member states it's made of. Yes. And the second thing he said, we as the UN, I as the UN Secretary General as, and you as the UN staff who works with the Secretary General, we are really the secretaries and the generals are the governments who are kind of defining what the global order and the international order and the international processes and, and um, uh, the substance of it should look like. Um, so I think um, those who, of us who are the idealists inside the UN also sometimes feel trapped particularly with the recent developments of, for an example, the Security Council not being able to adopt the resolution um, on COVID-19 or endorse the Secretary General's call for a global ceasefire during mm -hmm. the COVID-19 uh, crisis, calling all parties to lay down arms, at least during the period of the crisis to, to support a global ceasefire. Um, so this, th th there is a strong uh, growing frustration. I think just to also tap on what Secretary Albright said, um, a lot of the conversation that I have with young people in my capacity as the special envoy for youth, I often ask them, the UN is celebrating its 75th anniversary. What do you want it to look like when it's celebrating its 100th anniversary? Or how do you want its future to look like? And a lot of the things that the Secretary Albright mentioned actually have come up as key priorities from young people. For an example, there is a strong, um, I would say, disappointment regarding mm -hmm. the current status of global leadership among the more progressive uh, generations of young people, millennials and Gen Z, who are really taking out uh, uh, to the streets, demanding for justice, not just here in the United States, but also in countries like Lebanon or 
Chile or, or South Sudan and Sudan we've seen uh, immediately before the COVID crisis. So there is a strong need for um, stronger global leadership, but also with the COVID crisis and with the inability to act on key issues on global peace and security, inability to act on climate change. Mm -hmm. um, for an example, young people are questioning, is it fair that uh, these five countries, for an example, at the Security Council or the UN has this kind of power of veto and decide the future of everything else that is happening when they cannot control what is going on in their own countries. And, and Jonathan, can I just can I just go back to your first point? And this is and this is possibly unfair, but I hope you don't mind. Uh, I know that UN Secretaries General have always been frustrated at the President of the United States they've had to deal with, or for that matter, Russia or China. But at this particular moment, you've got in China, in Brazil, in Russia, in the US, to the extent you make the, make the case in the UK, leaders who are very focused on their national uh, affairs, their national politics. And is it not possible for Antonio Guterres, for the UN Secretary General to say, look, putting aside what the Security Council does, I have a, I have a stage, I have a platform, even a pulpit, as the UN Secretary General to be pushing for a global leadership and setting out that global agenda. And do you think it's a fair criticism of the UN that he and the UN as an organization should be setting that agenda, not waiting for leadership from nation states? No, definitely. And I think this is very well understood by the Secretary General, but also in uh, senior staff that works with him. You know. So for an example, after the COVID-19 crisis sort of began and was declared as a pandemic, um, the Secretary General started speaking to head of state and kind of proactively and took initiative to convene head of state as well. Just last week, he convened um, a number of uh, heads of government to talk about the financing, for an example, for the sustainable development agenda which has also been stalled because of the crisis and, and everything else that is going on with it. But we also worked in bringing together the entire UN system and the countries who you know, still contribute to and believe in multilateralism into producing some really strong guidelines as to when it comes to coming out of the recovery of the COVID-19 crisis, what can member states do still to uphold the, the commitments they have made to the UN Charter, the commitments they have made to social social economic inclusiveness into um, mitigating climate change. That, that, so that's every, what let's do. He has been... That. Sorry. Don't worry, so that's every week... <laughs> you usually no, every you get either my dog or been... my daughter, so it's someone, so don't worry about that. No problem. No, so I was just going to say that every week the Secretary General has been putting out um, what we call policy briefs to really push the governments and he's right. following up on them and he, he's following up with the head of state to make sure that at least in the recovery phase of the COVID-19 crisis, that the governments would listen to the UN's leadership and, and listen to the voice of the Secretary General. And particularly, I think one of the strongest commitments that came from the Secretary General is the call for a global ceasefire. And yes. we had about 170 countries endorsing the global ceasefire, including a large number of civil society organizations. I had youth organizations working in Libya and Cameroon and South Sudan, writing letters about how the global seas call for the global seas fine working in their communities so i think it is really disappointing that even something as important as that which has been endorsed by civil society groups youth groups women groups in the most far away communities in the world mm. could not be endorsed by some of the most powerful countries in the world right now yeah Jonathan, thank you um I, i'm going to bring in some of the other uh, people who are who sort of got their hands up or um um sort of raise attention in the chat. Um, one of Sani Mohammed, I think, is joining us. Um, Sani, are you there? Let's just see. If not, I'm gonna to come to I'll come I'll come back to Sani in a moment. But first, um Gail Smith. Oh there you are. Hello Sani, thank you so much. Hi, yes. Hi, hi, hi. Hello. There we are. Where are you by the way? I'm in Nigeria. Oh okay, great. Yes. Wonderful. Um, so, so, you know, I just wanted to pick up on the point that Jayathma was making, you know, all of us in different ways are feeling this need for global leadership and the frustration that it's not happening. It's easy to talk about it in theory, in practice, what would you like to see global leadership deliver? 
I, I think in practice, what we can see from global leadership, uh, uh, from some of the global actors who have really been at the front line and, and making headway is we really need to see um, empathy. We need global leaders to be able to put themselves in the shoes of the people that they are representing. Uh, because we, we, we find that during this pandemic, uh, lots of poor people, especially in Africa, who do not have livelihoods and who have been poor, who live below a dollar a day, they are hugely hit by this pandemic. Uh, I think there is need for an effective global strategy to uh, make this vaccine more equitable to people. I think communication is important. Uh, we must communicate with urgency and lead, global leaders must not downplay this situation. Uh, mm. they must, we must also stop this blame game we do. Uh, leaders must not reverse to being very defensive or putting mm. blame on who is making a mistake or is not. We should rather focus on making headway with solving this issue by creating a global strategy that is effective, an emergency response that can get this vaccine to millions of people who are vulnerable and who really need it when the vaccines are out. Because whether we like it or not, uh, uh, this virus does not discriminate. It does not discriminate based on any geographical uh, region or whatever. So we need an effective global strategy. If a country, say for example, like Canada or the US is making headway with their strategy, it does not guarantee the safety of the US when a country, say maybe like Nigeria or the, UA or the UK, is having serious issues of the pandemic because people must travel and the world is so complex. Uh, 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 so I think there is need for shared knowledge, shared information among global leaders, uh, keeping blames aside and looking towards forging partnerships, collaborations, and urgent communications that can make people understand, anticipate, and, uh, uh, and anticipate the, 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 the levels of complexity that this uh, issues comes with. Uh, uh, so I think for me, that is what global leadership should look like at this moment. Sandy, thank you so much. I mean, you, you, you couldn't see, but while you were talking, I was getting sent messages from people saying com completely right, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. And, I, and I'd, like to, I'd like to bring Gail Smith in because Gail, I suppose, you know, listening to Sunny, I think so many people are thinking to themselves, we're deeply worried about vaccine development and, and fair distribution to everyone. They're exasperated thinking, hang on, we're discussing quarantines, but surely there must be global coordination of what happens next on travel. Surely there be, should be some thinking about food security that is globally coordinated, information, debt, the list goes on. You know, at the one campaign, I know you're trying to think about how you campaign, how people like us campaign to deliver that global leadership. What can be done to make it happen? Well, I think, and I just want to underscore what Sonny said about empathy, because that's, that's fundamental to any of this. Um, and we're seeing a moment in time, I've never seen anything like this, when we've got a global pandemic and more fragmentation among world leaders than I've seen in my lifetime. And it's, it's dangerous, and I think what we're missing is some notion of the global public good. And what we've seen, I think this rise in nationalism and <clears throat> populism has created this false choice. You're either for your country or you're for the world. And this pandemic is teaching us, and it's gonna be very painful, it's not a lesson that's been fully absorbed yet, that that's a false choice. And as we see reimportation in the second wave and a huge amount of suffering around the world and all the knock-on effects, James, that you refer to, that will become evident. So the question is, so, so what do you do about it? I think on the vaccine issue in particular, we've found that it's very difficult to find people who don't believe that vaccines should be available to everybody everywhere. Whether we're talking about equity within our own countries, where we know that certainly in this country, healthcare is not evenly distributed or globally. And again, it's a, it's a matter of what's right, but it's also a matter of what's smart. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, this virus is just going to keep cycling. And I think <clears throat> what, what we don't have is a majority of leaders in international institutions behind that. What we do have is a growing coalition of the willing uh, with a lot of initiative taken by Europe and some major foundations to lay the case now for a system and the funding to make sure there's equitable uh, distribution. What we have some of but need more of is a public demand. And I think this is 
part of a vacuum in global leadership um, is about. We've got a number of leaders who have failed us completely on the pandemic. And we've got a number of world leaders who are actively trying to dismantle that kind of cooperation that Secretary Albright spoke to or the empathy that should be driving it that mm -hmm. Sonny spoke to. How do you deal with that? I think we've got to create a groundswell of public demand across borders that says this is what we expect. I, I would have said that's hard, but we should fight for it. And we had the one campaigner certainly doing that until I've been watching what's happening in the United States, where on another issue, but it's one that certainly overlaps if you look at particularly public health and the way this pandemic is unfolding here, there is a public demand for action on unresolved longstanding issues of system <clears throat> excuse me, systematic and institutionalized racism that is creating such a demand that I believe it's gonna force leaders to act. So I think the question, like we've got this real fragmented mess with some frankly off the charts crazy leaders messing up the entire planet. I don't know who I could be talking about. On the other hand, I have a rising groundswell of people who are saying that's not good enough. And what we need is to build that, build that network across borders, again, on something like vaccines, to say this is a global public good and we demand of our leaders that it be available to everyone. And Gail, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to sort of, uh, actually I'd like to bring in Claudia Craig because she made this really interesting point about how do you harness that determination? I think while Jayathan was speaking about you, uh, youth protest, youth activism, uh, I don't know whether Claudia, you're there. Yes, they, uh, there you are. Claudia, do you want to put, I mean, I was trying to be constructive if you like and think about how you take that energy and actually make it effective. But, but you go ahead, you'll make it better than me. Yeah, no, and I think in the context of the COVID-19 um, pandemic as well, I mean, UNICEF has said that the crisis risks becoming child rights crisis. So now more than ever, it's really important that children and young people are involved in the decisions that affect their lives. And I was thinking specifically about these large international forums like the U7, the U7, the G7, and thinking specifically ahead to the UK's hosting of the G7 next year about how we can raise the voices of children and young people at these forums and how potential hosts of the G7 could ensure the meaningful participation of children and young people in, in these spaces. Yeah. Gail, do you want to, Gail, do you want to touch on that? Like, for, yeah. for, I mean, you know about campaigning, what works? Um, I think what works, first I think there's a mindset and a colleague of mine at one, uh, in a recent conversation, in fact, with Team Tortoise, so we've got the G7, they need to understand there's a G7 billion. So I think, first of all, it's a, it's a mindset. It's understanding that we actually do have power. We have the power to vote, but we've got extraordinary power when we organize. And they're simple tools. We have a petition, for example, that, that is not a big ask. It's simply demanding a global response to a global pandemic, including on the vaccine front. We need to be able to show that literally millions of people are behind that. So there's got to be a, a way to demonstrate to leaders that their constituencies, because remember, leaders, at least those who are elected, uh, do pay some attention to what their constituencies think. Um, I think the second thing is on the media. Um, we've got to, I think, work harder to get the media to cover these issues from angles. I think Tortoise does a lot of this. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of debate about what's being normalized in terms of global governance. And I think way too much of it is being normalized. So how do we push there, not to say the media take a political position, but take a position based on the facts. Mm -hmm. Don't report that there is no global leadership on this pandemic yet, as though on the one hand that might be true and on the other hand it might not be. It is a fact. We've not seen the UN Security Council Act. The G7 meeting, maybe it will discuss it, maybe it won't. Um, and there's no urgency at the, at the collective level. So how do we push the media to do more? And the last thing I would mention, James, and I know oftentimes people are frustrated and feel like this doesn't really work, but my experience as the president and CEO of one, but also my experience when I was in government and one was actively advocating at me, uh, is that with some pretty simple 
training, and Sani and others know this from campaigns that have been run in Nigeria and elsewhere, people can organize to push for the policy change we want. Yeah. So well, I think well, organizing to do that. Is, well, the only thing I was going to say, Gail, is, I mean, you, you know this, we had, we had one of these thinkings with Gail a couple of weeks ago, and uh, there was an extraordinary moment where David Nabarro, you know, who's worked at the WHO, at the UN, is focused on COVID, was saying, you know, the world should be crazy. They should be demanding global action right now. People should be signing a petition in their droves. And, and as he was speaking, there was just a torrent of people saying, I'll sign, I'll sign, I'll sign. And I called Gail afterwards. And, and as she said, there'd been someone who'd said, you know, it's G7 versus the G7 billion. And, and Gail, you were making this point that we have to create the demand. We have to do something that gives people a sense of the demand for global leadership. And so on the back of it, for what it's worth in our own small way, um, and inspired by the one campaign, we're going to hold a G7 billion summit uh, in the middle of July, July the 16th, where we will try and bring people together to get a to-do list for what the uh, world could or should be doing. Because I think that you're right, Gail, there is something to be said for actually doing something that feels really important uh, important to us and um yes, and if i can just add a couple quick things on that part of the reason that david nabarro got everybody's attention is he was really impassioned yeah this was when the the attacks on the who were escalating before the us actually said we we're going to break relations with the who and he went off in a way that was compelling, on the point, and absolutely passionate. And I think people felt rallied by that. And I think, again, I refer, I live in Washington, DC, and I'm watching something quite extraordinary here. Uh, and that is when people are in passion, mm. they come together in big numbers, and there's solidarity, and there's not a lot of let's get into the weeds of every detail. Let's just be very clear. This is a very stark issue that is being, uh, or that is at the, at the forefront in the United States now. It actually has a huge impact. Mm. You know, we don't think anything would knock the pandemic off the front page. But it, does, but it doesn't. This country is talking about nothing but what do we do about the, the situation of racism in this country. So it's, it's possible, but we need passion. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to come, Gail, thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to come back to Jayathma in a moment just on the point that Claudia was making about youth activism and action. But, but, but Secretary Albright, I just, before we, we, we went down that particular path, you, you touched on something that is rather important uh, early on, which is the, the absence of US leadership, but then the nature of China's interest in the world. And I just wanted to get a sense from you of what you think the way in which China will engage or China is or could lead in the face of the global pandemic and, and other big uh, global challenges, not least climate. Uh, may I first comment on the youth? I mean, in many ways, the, uh, in, a, in the United States, there's a passionate group of young people about the UN. They all do model UN. They understand uh, how it works. They also are an awful lot of young people that, that think more internationally. So I'm all for that. The other part that I would just like to raise is that there are many more stakeholders in this than the nation states. And the private sector needs to be in this. The corporations as well as the non-governmental organizations. So that there are many, many groupings that need to be mobilized and work together. I'm sure we can get back to that. But the Chinese, let me just say the following thing is um, they have their historical uh, arguments in terms of having been disrespected for many years, et cetera, and they have mobilized nationalism also. Xi Jinping um, has, has kind of restructured the Communist Party or given it new life, but basically because of being a nationalist. Um, and they are filling a vacuum. And it's interesting to kind of put them in the UN contest, uh, context, because when I was there in the 90s, they didn't want to participate in anything. Uh, they basically only were interested if there was something to do with in, um, interference in internal affairs, but they are now filling the vacuum. And what they are doing is, um, you know, they have the Belt and Road Initiative, um, which is using a variety of their tools to, um, in many ways, get partners in other parts of the world, 
uh, by offering uh, how to uh, give them uh, some kind of uh, uh, financial help and building roads and doing a variety of things. I keep saying the Chinese must be getting fatter and fatter because the belt is getting larger and larger. But they are, in fact, uh, really pushing for a world role. Um, and I, there are an awful lot of very um, serious issues that we are now um, in, in a bad way in terms of how we deal with the Chinese, in terms of how the virus was dealt with in the first place, mm. uh, and then how they are going to operate if they get the vaccine first, how will they operate within an international system? So there are the various layers and levels of interaction internationally and how the organizations work in order to motivate. But this has to be, uh, as uh, others have said, is a passionate aspect of this and an understanding of what it is doing to societies all over the world, uh, mm -hmm. affecting um, people that uh, are not responsible for the virus having started. People that are, um, the only thing that they control is what they can do about their behavior. So it is a very, very difficult uh, situation in terms of international mobilization and how a virus can affect individual people in a deadly way, for sure. Secretary Albright, uh, as I said, I'll come back to Jayathma and then I'm going to go, there, there are a run of people who've got questions, observations, points they want to put to you. So I'm going to do that at a, at a gallop, if I might. Jayathma first, though, you were making a point about Claudia Craig's uh, observation about, about youth activism. Thank you very much, James. Yes, I, I, I also wanted to connect Claudia's point with what the point that Gail made. For an example, actually, there are already existing youth forums that happen alongside the G7 and the G20. But I think the key question to ask is, first of all, how many people know, how many young people know that these forums are happening? And also, who are representing young people at these forums? Because most often what I see is that governments either give accreditation to young people who are working in their own administrations or who are following their own political ideologies a part of their political parties or sometimes they end up going into sons and daughters of head of state or sons and daughters of ministers and and elites you know it, it never goes to actual young people on the streets university yeah. schools to come and represent their views as young people living in the g7 and, and g20 countries so so there's a lot of work that they are to be done to democratize that structure and then also share information so that more young people can be part of it. So I'll, I'll be very happy to work with Claudia and, and, and others on that to really um, make it work. And, and one point I wanted to make, maybe to be a little bit more provocative, James, if you may. Yes. Um, so right now, half of the world's population is under the age of 30. But an average age of a parliamentarian is 55. And this divide is highest in, for an example, Africa, where the median age is 19, but the average age of a politician is 66 years old. And oh we God. see this huge gap between those who are governing us versus those who are being governed. And this, in a way, um, pushes young people away from participating in formal political institutions. So you see a lot of young people protesting and demonstrating on the streets, but when it comes to them actually being part of political parties, being part of running for office, and taking up that rightful place, it becomes very difficult. And one of the reasons is, of course, political apathy among young people because of this mistrust political institutions have created. But secondly, you'll be shocked to know that 73% of the interparliamentary union's member countries countries have age restrictions when it comes to running for office. So our colleague uh, from Nigeria spoke earlier. So in Nigeria, for an example, you can vote when you're 18, but you can't run for office until you're 35, or I think for no. the Senate, somewhere around 40. Um, and they recently changed it and brought it back from 40 to 35. But I do believe that this there is a huge structural barrier when it actually comes to bringing in new ideas, new energy, progressive thinking into formal institutions because of the financial, economic, legal and structural barriers that are there that prevents young people from being part of political parties and political institutions. Jaffa, thank you very much. Just for what it's worth, we tried making the case recently in a piece that the House of Lords, the UK's second chamber, should be replaced by, if you like, a Senate that was elected not by geographical constituencies, but by generational cohort. 
so that each group was made sure that they had a uh, had representation. It, it hasn't taken off yet. We'll let you know how we get on. But 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 before before um, uh, going further, I'd, I'd like to actually, if I might, just bring in Bella Pollen because a number of people have made the point that picks up on your point, Secretary Albright, right from the start, which was about individual leadership. Who's, who's out there who's not necessarily an elected parliamentarian or politician, but does have real political clout? Bella. Thank you, James. Um, good evening, um, Secretary Albright. I was, I was just wondering, and I think lots of people have in the last week, um, who, who are the unifying voices of Black America right now? Who are people listening to? Um, and you know, who do they look to for leadership? Uh, how do we turn you know, this passion into something approaching change uh, you know, at, at the forthcoming elections? And, and what, are, what, are, what is this leadership saying to, to everybody out there? Because I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not seeing it, and maybe it's very fragmented. So I, I'd be interested in your views on that. Thank you, Bella. Uh, Secretary Albright, before I come back to that, I just want to get a couple of other voices because there's some people who've been waiting to talk to you. What, one is also Amir Paivar, who's, who's made a point about whether or not, as you say, it's not just nations who are going to be leaders out of this crisis, whether or not we need... Hello, Amir, why didn't you make a point? Hi. Uh, well, what I'm going to say probably is uh, very counterintuitive uh, in the aftermath of, uh, of COVID and uh, this deglobalization trend. But this has been with me since uh, a decade and a half ago when I was studying international relations, that nation states as the ultimate legitimate actor in the world today uh, are no more really working. We need a completely different structure. And I know this sounds very crazy, but every sector I've looked at has been disrupted. Even banking, which, which is most regulated. And I think we are entering an age where states will have to be disrupted and created along the lines, not of territories, which were per, a product of agricultural civilization, rather possibly values. I, I find more uh, in common with Gail and Jayatma than with my own neighbors here. So uh, some, some sort of a transition period where nation states are no more territorial and based on geography, rather based on uh, values, issues, people feel very close, closely together, and having, and having the legitimacy and the rights almost like states not but, oh, everything we are doing with campaigning, with, uh, with NGOs, with international organizations is try to influence nation states who are the ultimate actors. Maybe we have to change those ultimate actors and how they are defined. Uh, Amir, thanks. Um, Social right, do you want to touch on both of those? Who are the leaders now, particularly the, the, uh, the black American leaders who are going to be the, be the change? And do you think that actually the nation as the unit is going to be the change? It needs to change. Uh, this is not going to satisfy anybody because it is very hard to be concrete at this moment when everything um, is up in the air, more than I've ever seen. And I know that things are not going to be the same as they were before the virus um, in so many ways. And I am somebody that has been spending a lot of time thinking about the role of the youth. Um, they are what make me an optimist. Um, and they are uh, prepared to deal with a different world in terms of understanding technology and each other's relationships. But I think it is very hard at this moment to say uh, who are the, I can tell you a number of active black leaders, but again, also this is, uh, it changes every day. Um, and the demonstrations have been very important. There are some older leaders that are being turned to, for instance, John Lewis, who is somebody that worked with Martin Luther King and who came and stood out yesterday um, it, uh, on Black Lives Matter Plaza. And so there are some, and then there are new leaders and they are going to emerge in the next weeks. There's no question in terms of different states um, and where they're coming from things. So we are going through a very, very big transition. I do think that one of the issues here is that um, our national, our international basis is based on the nation state. And what has happened is there are countervailing uh, ideas. We're all, uh, we could talk about globalization and how much we've benefited from that. 
And that has a downside because it's faceless. And so people are now identifying themselves more with the boundaries, the states from which they come, um, which is interesting unless my identity hates your identity. And then it becomes hypernationalism and is very dangerous. Or technology, which has helped the Kenyan woman farmer be able to not walk miles to pay her bills. She can do it with a mobile phone and have an education and a life and a political career. Or uh, technology has also um, divided everybody in terms of where they get their information. So we are in a huge transitional period. And I think having discussions such as these and looking at who can work with whom in order to solve a problem rather than just arguing with each other I think is the answer here. Um, and trying to figure out um, that there are some groupings that are set internationally and some which just kind of emerge as a result of the enthusiasm or the person. I just saw one of these chats, Greta. Greta really mobilized in many ways um, the uh, climate change issues and, and uh, whether somebody will emerge. A young person working with an old person I do think transgenerational are important, but we are definitely in a very new era uh, because the governments aren't working properly um, and there are things that are affecting everybody. So I don't have an answer. I just know how to pick it apart. And, and Central Brad, it's, I, I think it's really interesting that, as you say, one person pointed out what Greta had done for climate, another what Malala had done for uh, education. And it's striking to Bella's point that I think we're all looking for someone that goes beyond institutional leadership that provides individual leadership and, wh and where that will come from. I I'm going to bring in, if I might, Shamsuddin Magadji, who's uh, a lawyer and also a social activist. I'm interested, Shamsuddin, if you're there, what, what your thoughts are on, hi there, um, what, what your thoughts are on what's the kind of leadership that's needed and, uh, and practically speaking, what do you want global leadership to deliver? Uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you for introducing me. I'm Shamsuddin. Well, what global leadership should look like from my own perspective, I, I would like to look at it from the angle of sincerity of purpose. If we, ha we are realistic about the cause we want to achieve, if leaders come together in a bid to achieve predetermined goals and objectives that are targeted at delivering change in their community, then it will go a long way. If they keep playing politics with everything and trying to just get their own gains out of everything, then at the end of the day, everything would go down the drain. So it behoves on all of us to come collectively. I'm very happy the Secretary General's envoy on youth pointed out directly of, on how youth are marginalized globally. If the politicians or those who vie for office should be 60 before they get into that particular place, then there's a very sad reality for us. There is mm -hmm. nothing left for the posterity if this continues. So sincerity of purpose and the leaders not willing to clinch leadership forever and allowing themselves to nurture the younger generation to grow will go a long way in achieving change globally. Shamsi, thank you very much. I mean, I think I really appreciate that point on sincerity of purpose. I'm going to, as we've just got a few minutes left, come back, if I might, to you, Secretary Albright, and just talk a little bit, if you might, about the US in the world and what you see in the next decade in terms of the US and the world. And, and I'll just remind you, before we got on, got everyone into onto the call, um, I was talking to you and you said rather brilliantly that you described yourselves in six words, worried optimist, problem solver, grateful American. Um, as a grateful American and a problem solver, what do you think the US has the capacity to do in this coming decade? Well, let me just say, I'm an immigrant. I came to the United States when I was 11 years old. Um, and was able to uh, have an incredible life and, and able perhaps to get a voice where I could make a difference. Uh, but I do think that um, we are in a very, very transitional period. I do, I happen to believe that the U.S. should be playing some kind of a role internationally, uh, helping in terms of dealing with the various um, uh, infrastructure and uh, groups that need to be helped, but not telling everybody what to do. Uh, 
nor feeling that we don't have any role to play um, and kind of isolating ourselves. But I do think that it is a particularly uh, dangerous time, but also a great opportunity to listen to the kind of voices that we've heard today and try to figure out how to create some kind of an institutional structure um, that is able to mobilize while and not just have everybody going off and doing their own thing because in that regard we might dissipate some of this incredible um, uh, enthusiasm for making a difference but it is going to take some kind of organization I would hope that the United States would be a part of it but not uh, uh, the the uh, the dictator of how things should be done or deciding that we're the best country in the world and we don't have to cooperate with anybody. Uh, but I do think that we need to work across the board with a variety of groups, whether I, I'm a great admirer of the one campaign in the many ways that has motivated people. I have been a great supporter of the United Nations, but I also do think that it's time to look at new organizational structures uh, that move into the 21st century world that is going to be very different from now on. And, and, and Secretary Albright, what would that new organizational structure be like? Well, I think that what it would do is have some combination of some of the best parts of things. You know, whether there would be a world organization that is able to bring uh, not only countries together, but um, as I mentioned, other elements, the private sector, uh, and um, non-governmental organizations. I think also there does need to be a look at the regional organizations that can work and then ad hoc organizations. And I do think one that would have generational differences in it uh, that would not eschew the role of technology and a free press um, and also recognize that there are no new um, problems like uh, cyber attacks and that space is a whole new uh, operation. People that have vision and imagination, but a real desire to figure out how to work together, not to be isolated and insulated. Secretary so, Albright, thank you. Um, Jayathma, um, a final word from you. What would you like to see happen next, either institutionally or practically? I mean, I, I completely align myself with what Secretary Albright already said. Um, if I'm talking about the United Nations, where I'm working at, um, the institution was made 75 years ago to respond to different types of challenges. But right now, the world has evolved, the challenges has evolved, but the institutions has not been able to evolve at that pace. And I think this also applies not just to the United Nations, but also our governments in our own countries as well, how our ministries work, how our local governments work, how our, uh, how our systems work in our own countries. But particularly, again, coming back to the United Nations, I agree completely with Secretary Albright. There has to be a seat at the table for young people, for women, for people from marginalized groups. There are tech companies now in the world that are bigger than five, six countries' GDPs combined. So how are we holding them accountable? How are we bringing those voices into the collective decision-making of our global order is a question that I think we all need to ask. But James, if I may, one second. I, I captured these four words during our discussion today, which I think answers your first and foremost question of what should leadership look like in this time of crisis? And those were truth, decisiveness, using technology for good and empathy. And I think yes. we have found ourselves at least some answers for this question that we were trying to tackle. So thank you so much for having me. Jathma, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and Gail, if there's one call to action you have, what is it? Um, <clears throat> it's a compound sentence, but um, I think the first part is to remember that times of disruption allow us to rewrite some of the rules. Mm -hmm. right? We all know that the rules that were written after World War II are not working even for many who wrote them, as a friend of mine says. And to the Secretary's point, we have the opportunity to actually reimagine some of the institutions we have and, and lay the ground for the institutions we need. But the flip side of that coin is that, you know, I find it's very easy to admire the problem, um, but then comes the question, what do we do about it? And I think one of the things we can't discount, and it's hard, it's hard, particularly now 
given the lack of global leadership and the, the unfortunate global leadership we're seeing in some places. Um, but we as citizens have to do something also. We have more power than I think we sometimes think we do. So whether it's organizing, voting, joining organizations, holding leaders accountable, um, I think we will get the leadership we want. But if we're inactive, we end up, I hate to say it, the leadership we deserve because I'm not sure anybody deserves the fragmented world we're living in. But it's all lot up to us. Okay, Gail, thank you so much. Um, listen, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we we are, have been so excited and energized by doing these thinkings in partnership with the One Campaign. And one of the reasons is that they're developing a pattern, which is that someone scores a spectacular goal in the last three minutes of it. And, and a couple of weeks ago, it was David Navarro talking about action. And I have to say, right at the end there, listening to Secretary Albright, thinking what a new kind of global organization could look like that brought in the private sector that has the capacity for ad hoc uh, organizations that's regional that's generational that tackles big future facing issues like cyber and space was just enormously energizing and thought provoking i suppose for all of us but as you can hear certainly for me i do think that there is something really uh, valuable and much appreciated for us as journalists to hear points of view on what global leadership is needed. I was really struck by what Sally said about, let's look at the fact that women leaders are just delivering at a better level uh, for their citizens. And, and what must we learn from that as, as women and as men? Um, Claudia's point about what young people can actively do and Jayakuma's kind of generous offer to say, okay, well, let's get in touch to do, make sure that we do actually do things. I thought Bella's question, and the question um, that, that I saw also from Christy, which was about who are going to be the leaders, who are going to be the leaders uh, for, for the issues that we face now. I'm fascinated by Amir's point about countries and nation states and whether or not there are better units for, uh, for dealing with the, uh, the problems the world faces. And I was really struck by Sani on the point about empathy and Shamsuddin on the point about sincerity of purpose. Um, for us, I suppose we take to heart the point that Gail made uh, right at the end, which is there are things that we can and should do. Um, firstly, forgive me, Gail, I'm just going to give a plug. Uh, there are only a couple of thousand more uh, uh, signatories needed for their petition to get over 50,000. You can actively do that now. Just flip from this, go and sign the One Campaign's petition. Um, please join us on July the 16th. Uh, we're not going to con convene the whole uh, group of 7 billion, but we'd like to give it a proper go, and we'd like to come away from it with something concrete, which is an agenda, a to-do list for the world that we can actually put out there in video, in podcast, in text, that we can spread on social media and say, look, these are the issues that need to be addressed by our global leadership and, and looking after the nation state is not enough. So please join us for that on the uh, 16th of July. But for now, um, please uh, do what we uh, uh, do at the end of these things, which is we can't give you, Secretary Albright, uh, Jayatma, Gale, a round of applause, but we can tell you how much we appreciate listening to you. So with a smile at least and a, and a wave goodbye, thank you very much and have a good day or a good evening wherever you are. <laughs>